Um, so welcome all to the fourth session of Map and Models. I will like to start by first apologizing because the last lecture I couldn't come, but I, Hugo told me that he uh, actually showed the current research we're having at the chair and at our PhDs. So you can have a glimpse of what is the applications of machine intelligence in different fields, so in architecture or in um, engineering. engineering. But um, so today I will show you um, here in our website from the chair, we just upload two files. The first is lecture four slides and the second one is lecture four code. So uh, the second hour of this course we will be coding, so please uh, download it now because Wu will start explaining and I will pass around asking um, solving questions or uh, any problem you have with the code. So we start now. Right, so the class of today is entitled Map and Model. So the first, um, first we wanted to keep the symmetry that we've been telling you about. So we have on the left side, or on the right side, we have map, data, machine intelligence, and objective. And on the right side, we have model, information, intelligent human, and personal. So I, I think it's important that you somehow now understand why is it that we are keeping the symmetries apart, so one and the other. And what is something that is easy for us to remember is that on the side of map and data, it's always objective. And on the side of model and information, it's always subjective and it's full of imagination, we say it like that. So. We will, in this lecture, give you some examples of how is it through, through history that these two concepts were always conceived. So for example, here is what we call a map. So this is the first trace of a map that appeared six centuries before Christ, and it was called the Babylonian Imago Mundi. So what is invariant in this map is not the geometry that it was used to represent, but actually the location of these specific points. So we can say that the map, what is capturing is data or is this location of points in the space. So maps are always, as I said, objective. They uh, keep invariant and they are position of numbers. Um, another example. Uh, the picture you're seeing, this is uh, Erastosthenes. He was the first, um, so he, he lived 300 um, in the third century before Christ. He was, uh, the, he was in charge of the, Alexand uh, the Library of Alexandria, and he was the first that created the ge geographic coordinate system. So what you're seeing here is him teaching a student from his book what he considered, what we consider a map, and his student is representing this position in time in the globe. So it's making these two parts explicitly. Another, um, another example we bring today is also Ptolemy. We already presented in the first lecture. So Ptolemy, this is two centuries before Christ. And he asked his friends, the sailors, to record the vertical positions when sailing. And he was able to, to know the horizontal by knowing how much time the trip took. So by this, he was recording points in space in the book that is called Cosmography. So this book was actually the basis for all the models that came after uh, Ptolemy. And if we, if we question what is that we consider a map today, so we give now just one example. So this is uh, GPS. So what this is giving us is these positions or locations in space without rendering its geometry yet. So if we think of a map as this collection of numbers, as these that can be handled with arithmetics, that is absolute, that is objective, then we question what is it a model. So we say that in contrast of the map, we have the model, which always deals with geometry. And it's on the side of in intelligent humans, 
it's personal, it's subjective, and it brings information. So what we're going to see now are all the maps, sorry, are all the models that were projected pr uh, by the coordinates that Ptolemy recorded in his book. So and what is interesting to see is that they are the same points in space, but they are represented differently. From 1500 to 1700, there are some spots that were known, but they were filled with unknown creatures or uh, monsters. Um, for example, I just bring another map. This is from 1459. This was considered Europe at that time, and it was full. So the globe was full, and uh, because they didn't know what was, um, what was, uh, for example, the Ameri uh, North America and South America country. So they, some spots they did they, that they didn't know what was it. They filled they filled it with whatever they thought it was there. So islands. Uh, small pieces of continent and so on. But then after, this, uh, after Columbus traveled to the Americas, then they start thinking that that's not reality. So if they thought actually that the globe was complete, that they already knew every spot there, they find out that this was just part of the, of, of the globe. So you see already there that the Americas was still on, in the process of being written. But it's interesting just to, to see that everything that, is try that we're trying to, to project or to render are the same points, but in time it changes how we see it. Um, and also it, it, this can be a stress when we think that in order to create what we know understand as a map, we need to have map projections and datum, datum types. So with the map projections, we can choose from Universal Transfer Mercator, <coughs> military grid reference system, United, Nation, United States national grid, and with datum types we can choose from WGS84 or ellipsoid, and so on and so on. So it's always depending on the intention you have, and it's always depending on what is that you want to have as a return. And it always, uh, it always have this uh, map of points, and it always it has a render, of, or what we call the model. And we have another example. So if you go into your browser and you type the world, world globe in English, you will see that it actually is rotated to, uh, to have United States. And if you type it in Russian, you see that it goes and centers Russia. Or in Chinese, it goes into China. So it's an interpretation, or it depends actually in this intention that I'm stressing <laughs> again and again and again. So if you type the world, world map, the same happens. So if you, uh, if you see here in English, it positions the center where England is. In Russian, it positions Russia in the center, and in China, the same. So imagine if just by language, the type of, the type of rendering you get is different. If we are different people, then it should be different for each of us. Um, and also, another story that I wanted to tell you is about how cartography was uh, developed. So there was always two tasks, the ones that from the surveyors and the ones from the cartographers. So here are just um, definitions of the current positions of each of them. But it was always like that. So surveyors were in charge of collecting evidence or reviewing data and marking uh, uh, lands of plots. And the cartographers, they were, they were in charge of creating or reviewing this spatial data on developing maps. So already there, these two tasks or these two differentiations that I'm presenting to you, they were tangible. And then we ask today, what is um, a model of today? So this picture is from Google Maps. And we argue this is a model, is not a map. And um, so now that we have this example in cartography, we move into architecture. So what are the models and maps in architecture? So I bring first Vitruvius. He's quote, uh, I'm quoting him where, when he say, architecture is the art of jointing things together. And then he adds that in, uh, in order to become an architect, you need to be sure that you have fabrica and ratiocinatio. And he stressed that ratiocinatio is the way we reason about how these things are joined, and fabrica are the act of joining things. 
So if, if he was already sure that in order to become an architect, we need to be conscious that there are two parts of architecture, the one of reasoning and the one of acting, the one of knowing and the one of, um, of doing, then we can, uh, we can continue this idea of how is it that we have to be, um, that we have to do both at the same time. And then also we see it with Alberti in his treatise on De La Pintura. So he said, I will take first from the mathematicians those things with which my subject is concerned. So there he also, he also split it in the re from representation to bring in rules that actually can um, help him to have this projection. So with mathematicians, when he means mathematician, he means arithmetics and equations and formulas. And then in the in the city trees, he developed the first time perspe the perspective. So he by by uh, thinking that there are these differentiation between the, the representation and between the rules that are behind, he was able to create the first tool uh, that allows architects or artists to actually project reality. And if we come back with what we have been showing you from the beginning, this idea of the model and map, that they are always in circulation, meaning that it doesn't, so it doesn't mean that you have a map and then a model, it means that you have a map, then a model, then a map, then a model. model sorry. And then it's in circulation and you as an architect decide when is it that you want to stop and you can bring the reasons and you can uh, explain why it's like that. And we see that in order to move from the model and the map and so on, we need to have this machine intelligence and human intelligence. Uh, so we question then, what are the maps of today? So what you're seeing now are just data from the, from the web. So we have statistical data from the UN, we have social media data, we have news, we have stock market data, we have everything that you can imagine is already in the web. So for us, today in the digital world, we think that the maps of today are everything that you can get from there, which is representing the world, but is not, sorry, which is trying to represent the world, but is not representing the world. It's a step before what, we, we, what we're saying, the projection. Um, so what are the models of today? And I will just bring again the examples that we had at the beginning of the class, the first lecture, where we, where now I will, uh, with more time, explain you which were the tools, the databases, and the way they actually create them. So this was an example we did at the beginning of the lecture just to test if this makes sense. So we call it a color spectrum of a city by objects in social media. So the database we use was social media posts from Sao Paulo. And by running these algorithms of image identification or feature extractions, we were able to transform the image into numbers. And these numbers later were fed into an algorithm for, clus from, for clustering where we can, by finding similar patterns, similar images were clustered together. And what you're seeing here in color are all these clusters that were formed based on similar patterns projected back to space. So that's why we're calling it a spe uh, color spectrum of a city by objects in social media posts. So another example, which is more into hard data. So here is more factual. Uh, we call it drought encoding time range. So here it's data from uh, a time lapse of six months about how much rain it captured in a specific site. And so here, what we wanted to show you actually is that you don't always need to present data as it, in, as it is, but you can actually play how is it that you want to communicate it. Another example is uh, from Eric Fisher. So we call it go through any city without any previous knowledge of it. So the data, the database that he used was um, millions and millions of Flickr pictures. And what he cared about, rather than the objects <coughs> or the RGB values of the images, was the metadata that they have. So the metadata makes reference to the position of the, the position or uh, the time it was taken. So here he was able to draw a map, uh, draw these, uh, we call it, 
render of the city without even knowing any, uh, without even being there and knowing how the streets were created. So here you can actually see that the more dense it is, it's more a touristic site, the more spread it is, it's more residential or an industry and so on. So with this image, you can actually have, uh, you can actually project also what you're seeing and start discuss discussing about it. So next example is uh, make cities comparable based on social media. This is a project that is called Selfie City. This is, we bring it like this because it's not as we, uh, it's not um, common as we think. So when we think of a, a model, we always think that it should be projected on space, but I think this is also a model. So the database they use is a, a post from social media, but on a time lapse for many cities. So by that, uh, the researcher was able to compare many cities at the same time to know which were the keywords or the key objects that were, that were presented. Another example that I, I am bringing now, sorry, it's uh, we call it uh, correlate moods and lifestyles. So here the database it's used is um, factual data. Also, so it has the location of trees, it has the, G the GPS coordinates from taxis, and it also has the statistical data of robbery. So here the, the scientist, he wanted to cross all of this factual data and see if it actually has a pattern that can be read or not. So it's interesting uh, for you to see this because this is not an end project. This is a continuous project that by interpreting what is there, you can actually make conclusions or you can actually know what it is that you want to research or you want to crawl or you want to process more. So it's never an, uh, it, it of course, will, you will have to handle something, but it's not the end there. You can also always go go and have reflections and, 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 and discuss what is it that you want to see here. Another example is this uh, panorama of collective intelligence. So here the database are the current research topics and science. And the interesting thing is that the algorithms, they actually don't know yet what is it that they are going to produce or the, what is it that they are going to uh, cluster in this sense. But by, by transforming anything, for example, in this case, text into numbers, they are able to be this generic machine that can produce this clustering. So what we're seeing in the screen are these keywords of crowdsourcing, sensor data, citizen science, and so on. So the machine doesn't know what is it, but it knows that it has a repetition and is commonly used in these fields. Another example, uh, it is articulate semantic music landscape. I, I found this very interesting because it's from um, an open library of music. So here the, the, the artist or the scientist transform the, the, um, the lyrics of the music into numbers and was able to create this smooth pattern map where every uh, representation of uh, style of music like for example if we see like um indie rock it's close to indie and then to experimental and then to post-punk so without even knowing what music is this algorithm was able to cluster them and create this landscape of music so you can you can work with <laughs> you can work with any type of of data and create these um, amazing renderings where you can actually start discussing what is it that you want to <laughs> talk about and the last example is this uh, consider proba probabilities rather than predefined grammars to define a road network. So again, here, a colleague of us, he, uh, he crawled J GPS data from taxis, and he was able to, again, render the city without even being there by just knowing how they travel around the city. So there are many questions regarding how you how you see a city, how you want to render a city, and these in this course they should be personal to your requirements. Or was it what is it that you want to actually work or discuss or in that interests you the most? So um, 
Then I question, what are the tools of today? If we go back to Eratosthenes and to the Greeks, we know that the tools for representing or for rendering these models were the ruler and the compass. We go to Renaissance, and we know that this tool was perspective. And then what is the tool that we have to use now in order to create these models? And we argue is machine learning. So we call it the ruler of the digital age. And um, so I gave you some examples from cartography to architecture. And again, I'm bringing you the question, or I'm telling you what is that we think is the tool. So now Google will continue and explain you how is it that this tool, uh, the tool that we're going to use in these experiments is it's, uh, working. So. Mm -hmm. so thank you, Carla. Uh, yeah, so in the following slides, I will quickly explain, like, uh, well, I would say two type of machine intelligence algorithms that basically deal with clustering as one uh, typical task and the prediction as the other. And before I jump into these two uh, tasks, I would like to first quickly give a, let's say, rough example of, of uh, maps of building. <coughs> So I took this diagram from our first lecture and uh, give this uh, very rough example. So for example, when we're talking about buildings, we can describe it as uh, area, as the building cost, as the location, as the price that we, uh, if we want to buy, buy one, the energy consumption level and the service life and so on and so on. So basically we describe an object from different perspective using uh, different uh, measuring uh, ways. And then uh, the, inter the interesting thing is, imagine if we do the same measurement for all the buildings of Zurich, for example, or for the, all, the, all the buildings of Switzerland, then we get uh, a collection of buildings measured in a similar way. And what is interesting is that from this collection of data, we can not only doing uh, statistics for example we can we can calculate the mean average uh, the, the average area of all the buildings or or the average height of the buildings but what can do, but what we can do more is we can somehow compare buildings by comparing uh, by by measuring how similar uh, their numerical representations are so and uh, yeah, and uh, how how we uh, actually do that is by uh, Euclidean distance. So imagine, for example, I have a house with area of one of one hundred square meters, and the other has let's say ninety square meters, and then I also have two price. Then I can simply measure this uh, measure the difference of these two numbers, and to to somehow say if these two buildings are similar or not. And and based on this idea, so we can we can imagine that uh, if we have the collection of all the buildings, then we can easily build a chain of uh, similarities. We can start with a random building, let's say a house at the beginning, then uh, we say that we sort the other buildings based on their similarities to this house, and therefore we get a chain of, of, of buildings that the each, that the, uh, each neighbors of these chains are becomes very similar to each other. To each other, but then in the end, uh, the two ends of these chains uh, are quite different. So, for example, we can smoothly change from uh, house to temple to office to factory, for example. Mm -hmm. And then this will be the this will be the very interesting part that we uh, we can we can get from from this way of measuring things, from this way of representation. And then uh, the a valid question that can be asked to this chain is, so because we know that we can category uh, buildings by, by their for example, different functions, so like we have houses, we have temples, we have everything, but then since this chain is it's, it's changing smoothly, then how we can tell the boundaries of different categories, how we can say that uh, why this building is a house and not a factory, for example, then where's, where should we put these boundaries? boundaries? And also, uh, because this chain is built based on the similarity of numbers and then what happens if we simply take a part of these numbers to, to, to rebuild this chain? Will, will for example, similar will buildings that have similar areas and locations uh, has similar price uh, as well, for example? So what would be the, what would be the result? So basically, 
uh, these are the two um, typical questions that we can ask towards this uh, a collection of, of numbers and then uh, of course the here the, the, the example is, is is building but then in uh, in the end uh, this uh, the, 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 this type of questions are valid to any type of data that we may collect we may represent with numbers and then uh, mm, so, so basically, uh, so basically, these two type of uh, these, these two questions represent two type of um, um, task. That one is trying to cluster things, and the other try to predict things. So the first would be uh, that the, from a collection of numbers, we try to we try to distinguish specific categories from them. Like let's say, uh, where where are the houses, where are the factories, and from the second, we somehow try to predict another group of numbers by a group of number we have for example try to predict the price from the uh, from the area and from the location so so following this uh, two uh, two type of task two uh, two uh, yeah two questions so i would uh, i would quickly uh, go through uh, let's say two family of of, of algorithms, they are they are they are quite prominent, but they are not the whole story. But, but because er, actually, uh, that algorithm deal with similar problems a, a lot, and uh, there's no way I, we can introduce here that uh, to you all of them. So we we, we took the these are the ones one. we we actually yeah. work with. Yeah, so yeah, we yes. recommend that, that you can also work with yeah. those. So so the first. Uh, Two algorithms I would like to introduce uh, called K-means and self-organizing maps. So they are, uh, so they deal with uh, clustering. So they they are really good for finding different groups out of a collection of things. So I would quickly explain how how they works. So uh, so K-means uh, basically, well 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 I start with this diagram. So let's assume that on the left we have a collection of data. So each uh, each row is one, um, let's say one building, and we measure all the buildings in a similar way so that each column represents the same uh, factor. Of, of course, I made up uh, the numbers here. But then, uh, after we have this collection of data, uh, we randomly generate some, we generate some random, random numbers showing in the middle, and we call this a kernel. It will be the center point of, the, of each cluster so here, this point means uh, is not means a geometrical point. It means uh, a point in this multi-dimensional space. So, for example, if we measure uh, buildings uh, based on four type of uh, properties, then we can say that we are in a four-dimensional space. Let's say. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so, so with this data and the and and the, and the center point we have, we can. We can assign each data to its nearest the center point based on the Euclidean distance, mm -hmm. and then in the end, each center point we will uh, correspond to a, a subset of the data we have. And then the, what what uh, what this algorithm do next is to replace the old value of this center point to the new uh, to the mean value of the subset it corresponds, and. And, this, and therefore, we get a, a, a list of new, uh, let's say, kernel, new uh, center points. And then, uh, after we have the new center point, we repeat the mapping process and then the, the calculation of the mean value again and again and again. And eventually, this center point, the value of the center points becomes uh, stable. And then the correlation between the map and the center point somehow gets stable as well. And then this is the this is the stage that we can say, okay, uh, these three data belongs to category one, and these two belongs to category four, and uh, so on and so on. And so, for example, here will be a visualization of the of the process. So you see that there are many small dots represent uh, <coughs> many uh, data points in two dimensional space, and then there are also three large dots. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly. So. Is, uh, the three large dots represent the center point of the three clusters. And then uh, one iteration after the other, uh, the, uh, the, the, the process I mentioned in the previous slide repeats so that the, uh, the value of, of the center point of each cluster changes, and as well as the cor uh, correlation between uh, data and, uh, and the center point. So that in the end, for example, if you see 
uh, when it gets stable, so a part of the data belongs to cluster one, maybe showing in red, the other belongs to cluster two, it's in, in, in yellow, and so on and so on. So basically this is the idea of uh, k-means. And what we do is typically say um, how many clusters we want to have, we want to extract from this collection of data. We can say that, okay, I want four clusters so that I, uh, at the beginning, I, ra I randomly generate four center points and, and then let the center point move by itself. And uh, this code I will also show you at the end of this lecture so that I, we actually wrote a mathematical code so you can play with it. And now, uh, but, but, for, but for the idea of this uh, algorithm, it will be, it will be, it, it will be quite simple. And uh, uh, another algorithm uh, that doing similar tasks will be called self-organizing -organi map. And uh, it is quite actually quite similar with k-means, except that uh, with k-means, we know uh, how many clusters we have and uh, where are the center points of the, each cluster. But we somehow don't know the relation between every two clusters, uh, every two clusters, yes. So for example, we have, uh, we have three, uh, from, from a collection of buildings, we can say that, okay, here is, here is house, here is factory, here is office, but then how similar they are and uh, how, 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 how do we uh, put them together is somehow uh, confusing. So a uh, self-organized map is addressing this issue by a predefined uh, topology. So this algorithm is introduced by Ke Kehonen in uh, 1982. So what we see here on the right is a diagram shows the self-organizing map. So each, each circle here represents one uh, center point of the, uh, of the cluster. So, so uh, each point would contain uh, a, a list of numbers, a set of uh, numerical values. But, uh, but the, but the uh, important thing is that the, the points are also connected based on um, uh, and also on a grid, so that uh, you know which point are close to which point, uh, not not uh, not by its numerical value, but by this defined uh, predefined topology. And so, after we have this setup, uh, we also get a collection of data, which uh, which I use some random generated number to represent here. And we uh, so this this process is called training. So uh, for every iteration, we randomly take one uh, data from our data set and we, uh, we find which uh, center point of this self-organizing map uh, is, uh, is the nearest one to, to the data we select based on Euclidean distance. And we say this selected cell is the best matching unit. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can assume that this data correspond to this blue uh, cell here. And then what, what this algorithm do next is to update this cell, the value of this cell, as long as uh, its neighbors, uh, based on the data uh, 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 we select. So, so, this cell, uh, so this center cell becomes more similar to this data we, we just selected. And then uh, after select one data, we, select, we randomly se select another data and repeat the same process and also again and again and again. So after all the data are, are, are being processed, which we call one, um, let's say one round of training, then we can, we can reduce the, the effective uh, radius of, uh, of the cell so that, the, so that uh, in next time, uh, not too many neighbor cells are, are, are being processed in a similar way. And then basically this round will, 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 will continue for, let's say, Five or ten rounds on, until uh, eventually each data set, each data only, only, only change the, the the best matching cell itself, not its neighbor anymore. So basically, this will be the this will be the whole idea of uh, self organizing organizing map. Mm -hmm. So you see that it's actually uh, similar with k-means because it also changed the value of center uh, cells based on the value of the data we have. But the difference is that because the predefined uh, topology, uh, uh, adjacent uh, center cells will, will, will tend to be similar to each other so that at the end we get a map that, uh, that uh, has a, 
a smooth change in pattern like uh, like the, the the neighboring cells are never being too 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 different to each other they somehow always stay similar so this will be the idea of this algorithm and uh, and of course uh, implement this algorithm is is kind of more complicated than the k means so uh, see, so we will not uh, go into details how the algorithm are implemented but instead we can we will show you an well, interesting example how this uh, algorithm can 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 can, can pr produce some result so for example here uh, we have an image shown on the left we can simply let's say randomly take some points of this image and then um, and then extract the color at this point so that we have a collection of points uh, a collection of rgb values and then we use these rgb values to train a self-organizing map and the map after the training the self-organizing map can be visualized uh, uh, like this showing on the right and so after we have this we can say now i have another image and for the for each pixel of this another uh, of this new image i simply find the best matching unit in the self in the trained self-organizing map and try to replace the old uh, color of each pixel to the new color of the best matching unit and then in the end this will be the result we have that somehow the new image keep its contents but the style and the and the color are changed based on the previous image we have so 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 somehow we we we, we change the style of the of the image so this will be one example of of this uh, self organized map can do but of course uh, uh, it can it can do also many other things and we will uh, we will uh, continue showing you and making experiments in the following lectures so basically this uh, this this is the story for the first task uh, clustering so um, and i would uh, like to quickly jump to the other task which is predicting and for predicting there are actually also many 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 algorithms but here i simply uh, take one because uh, well obviously it's 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 very popular right now and also because it uh, it really works very well mm, so new yeah so neural networks neural networks is uh, actually doing a, I, I i've shown this diagram in the first lecture so neural networks is, is actually doing a very similar job as regression which is uh, finding the correlation between the input and output data so for example in regression we uh, for example linear regression we can assume that the input uh, the output value is linear related with the input value for example the uh, the, uh, the, the the age and the height of human for example and then and then uh, what what uh, what a neural network do is 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 in a is in a very similar way that uh, you have the you have these red dots that represent the data you have and a neural network will try to uh, connect all these dots via a smooth blue line so that you not only know what happened at each dot but also know what happened between each dot so that you kind of uh, making a generalization mm -hmm. on top of it. So this will be the idea. And what difference between neural network and the regression will be, uh, for regression, we always assume that the, that the, we always predefined a correlation, for example, linear correlation or polynomial correlation, a two degree polynomial or three degree polynomial, so whatever. But then for neural network, uh, this assumption is somehow abandoned and uh, the correlation will be learned from data itself. Mm -hmm. So which makes it more uh, more let's say general mm -hmm. and uh, if you if you if you search for artificial neural network on google and basically you get you get many uh, diagrams that, that looks very similar uh, as the one showing on the left so you see a circle that somehow represent a neuron and some arrows represent the uh, uh, the input and output of numbers and uh, which 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 reminds us a lot as the re how real neural cell uh, looks, which is shown on the right. But then, uh, but then this this is just a visual similarity. But actually, in the end, uh, how this artificial neural works is quite different from uh, from 
from a neural cell uh, works in biology. So I would uh, quickly go through it. So, uh, so basically, from this diagram, we can see that for, for this neural, we have three inputs. Let's call it input X. And the fu what this neural did is uh, you, you calculate the dot, pro uh, dot product of the input X, which, which is a vector, which is, a three, uh, which, which, uh, which is three values shown here. You, you, you calculate the dot product, and, and then you pass the result to a function uh, which is uh, which uh, which is called the activation function and then you get an output by and uh, by by repeating uh, the number of neurons and actually you see that the effect will be equivalent to adding more columns in the matrix multiplication and so um, so the effect of this neural will be a you do some kind of transformation mathematically. Trans you do some kind of transformation to your input data, and because uh, if you simply multiply this input data with a matrix, this transformation will be linear. And in order to make it non-linear, so that it approximate a uh, arbitrary function, uh, people introduce uh, activation function, so that the output of this matrix multiplication goes through this activation function and get another output so basically this is the idea and then uh, the, the whole column of neuron showing here uh, we call it a layer which is a fully connected layer so that every input are, are fully connected to the to the to, to the to the to the to every out output we have so for example we have three input and three outputs so that we have nine uh, numbers in the middle, so it's a it's a three by three matrix, and of course with neural network it's possible to uh, extend the layer by simply adding more computing units, more new neurons, so that we again have another uh, 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 layer of transformation, which is also non nonlinear, and then combining the first and second layer, we eventually get a neural network model that. Uh, that maps the input three-dimensional uh, vectors to the output of two-dimensional vectors, which is shown, which is the case shown here. And of course, you can play with the number of input, number of output, and also how many uh, computing units in the middle, so so that you get different uh, type of uh, models. Let's say, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So here is a very simple and very uh, popular example of how uh, of this neural network works. And of course, here the result is not perfect because you will see some errors uh, later. So the idea is very simple because uh, so so the task is to recognize hand uh, hand written hand written digits, and each uh, each digit is represented in the grayscale image of size twenty eight by twenty eight, which is uh, seven hundred and eighty four numbers. And the idea is to use these numbers and build a neural network model, as I explained before, so that these 782 inputs are eventually mapped to 10 outputs, which correspond to the 10 g digits we have. And then um, by having this setup and a collection of, uh, of, of, of uh, handwriting digits, uh, picked, uh, images we have, we can we can adjust, we can train this model, which means adjust the, the matrix value of the previous model. And then eventually when, when, uh, when the output get converged, we get uh, a neural network that uh, is capable to predict the hand, uh, handwritten digit. And this, this training process is based on the, based on the gradient of the, of, of the whole setup because the whole setup is, uh, is what's the word for that? Uh, differentiable so that you 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 know you know the gradient of each object of, of each of each uh, weights of each values and you can adjust the values based on the gradient of, uh, direction. But these are the details things I would skip. So, but the uh, and and a problem of this setup would be the uh, explo explosion of parameters when we try to use neural networks on images because uh, obviously when we increase the resolution of the image the number of the pixels like uh, increase dramatically for example uh, in the 16 by 16 case we only have 256 uh, pixels but if we 
increase the resolution to 256 by 256, then we have uh, 65,000, more than 65,000 uh, of pixels. So it's a lot. And uh, if we if we naively took uh, the fully con connected uh, layers to to all the tasks, then we will soon face the problem of compute uh, computational time and the resources. So that uh, so that it's it's very time consuming to train such a model. It's very it's very memory consuming to run such a model on a laptop, for example. So it, it will be really really slow and. How to how to solve it is actually the uh, the idea of convolutional uh, neural network. I will quickly explain the concept by diagrams. So, for example, here is the diagram of a typical uh, fully connected uh, neural network that the, that all input are connected to all output. So that, for example, here in this case, you have a six by four equals to twenty four. Uh, numbers that need to be adjusted in the training process. But the idea of uh, convolution is you reduce the size of the matrix and you move this small matrix along uh, the input vector you have. So instead, therefore, it, it, it can be, the process can be shown like this. So in the end, you still get a four dimensional output from the six dimensional input, but uh, but uh, the number of uh, parameters you need to adjust is just three because it's just three by one matrix is very small. So uh, why this is uh, why this is uh, interesting and uh, prominent because on the one hand it it um, it dramatically reduces uh, the number of parameters we want to uh, adjust during the training process and on the other it assumes that the that the, the, the uh, each numbers of the input vector has some spatial correlation, so that I I assume that the first three uh, numbers are let's say close to each other, and the second three number are also close to each other. So that so that which means it's 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 very uh, it's very uh, suitable for processing uh, images because for images each each pixel are also uh, depending on their neighbors so that they, they, they eventually form an object. And, and this, uh, this uh, one-dimensional uh, case can be easily extended, extended to two-dimensional. So for example, I have a six by six image here and a three by three uh, small matrix here showing in blue square. Then how this blue square moves is basically vertical and uh, horizontal uh, together. So that if after this small window moves across the entire uh, input image, you eventually get an output image that is a slightly smaller, but uh, but keep the spatial correlation. Mm -hmm. So this will be the idea of the convolution neural network. And of course, uh, the the technical detail will be very complicated. But then, uh, but then the, the 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 idea will be as simple as as this. And uh, uh, here is another example of how uh, how this convolutional neural network can do. So I will also uh, share the code uh, after the talks end. So basically, here, uh, for example, I have a, I have an image as an input, and I randomly generate some numbers as this small uh, moving matrix. And then I simply do this convolutional uh, operation as I explained before, and then the output numbers I can render them as an image again, so that you see that somehow it uh, because the because the because the number are randomly generated, so that the uh, the output are quite different each time I run the code. But then basically it it do some kind of uh, um, feature extraction from the original image. For example, you can see that for for example you may see that. Uh, the edges are highlighted, or a particular part are highlighted, and uh, it would be it it would be very interesting to play with. So, and uh, yeah, I think basically, uh, basically for, for for the technical part would be this these two uh, branch. So one uh, one type of algorithm are particularly designed to. Uh, to to making clusters and the other the and the other are more or less um, predicting that mm -hmm. the, we already know a part of the numerical 
representation that we want to predict what happened for the other part. And uh, basically all the, not all, but most of the um, problems that we are facing in, in different applications can eventually uh, be abstracted into to into this two type of task mm -hmm. and then therefore makes these two methods uh, really really prominent and uh, well I think mm -hmm. this will be my part yes um, before going to code I wanted just to stress one last idea so if we think of um, what is the perspective what was the perspective in the Renaissance we can actually think how is machine learning now for us so when perspective was invented there, everyone could learn how to do it, but not everyone could actually be a ma create a masterpiece with that. So I think it's the same, this in the same way it's happening now. So everyone can learn it, but we need to be able to create these masterpieces. And we think that in order to be able to create these masterpieces, we need to be aware of how it, what, the difference between these two tasks that we are asked to do. So we have to have the difference between what is it um, with this, this um, data, with this information, and how we can use these technologies in order to act on each of them to create this masterpiece or this end product that we're asking you to have. Um, <clears throat> so we, we wanted, as always, to open up questions on your side. If you have, uh, if anything we said during the course actually triggers your way of thinking, or if you want to challenge something we say, um, so this is the moment you can actually say it out loud. So if not, I will bring a question so then you can actually ask. Uh, uh, during the course, uh, we actually present you, I will just quickly move to that slide. Wait, it's faster if I do it. So we told you this is a model of today, right? So this is Google Maps. Do you, will you argue that this is not a model, <coughs> but this is a map? Or do you agree with us that this is actually a model of today? So I was actually, at the beginning when I was, pr uh, when we were getting, uh, when we were uh, selecting the slides for this lecture, there was this question of um, reality. So mm -hmm. whatever you're seeing in these pictures is what is in there, like yeah. by the number of objects that are represented in the image. So you can actually think that, yes, yeah, so this is, this is reality, reality yeah. but we argue it's not because a city is more complex than just these RGB values that you're seeing in an image. But what is confusing is that we are using this Google map as it is what uh, it is the representation of reality in order to navigate through, which is a very nice tool, it's very useful. But if we take it for granted that this is the, this is the way that you represent the world, then this is very dangerous because it's not, for us, it's not the way. It's one way, it's just one way of doing it. Yes. No, it will not be reality itself. It's one abstraction of reality. We're just talking about abstractions. We have the abstraction, the first one that they call a map, which is in the side of data, in the side of numbers, mm -hmm. in the side of the plentiness. Yeah. And we have the model, which is in the side of information and representation. So both are abstractions. Both tries, both tries to, 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 to talk about reality, but it's not reality itself. What we call, so if we see this for us, the map in order to create this model of Google Earth are all these um, database they use for its satellite images and all the locations they have, all the tools they use. So all of these things are the model, the map for this um, model of Google Earth. So it's just one way of looking what, for example, what city is, we can see it from the view of satellite. We can also see it from the view of uh, street views, for example. We can also observe it based on populations, based on uh, functions of, of 
of land use, mm -hmm. for example, then we can we can see the same object in a <coughs> many many different ways. But then still, they are the we argue that they are the representation of this thing, but not the not this yeah, thing so itself. That's therefore. why we say a model because it's one yeah. example of the plenty of models yeah, yeah. that can be produced with the same map of data. I think that in a few words, a model is basically showing us something, any model, and a map is analyzing something, some kind of information. I think analyzing is on the side of uh, the tools. So yeah, if, yeah. You, if, you, if, you, if we go back to this scheme that we show you with the map and the model and these vertical lines that we call the bridges on the communication, this analyzing is on the bridges, on this bridge of machine learning in our case now of digital age. But data, it's not analyzing. Data is actually, um, it's more abstract than the representation. So if we make it, uh, if we make it uh, more explicit, it will be like these full numbers that I was showing you that you can capture in the web or you can have it in uh, the coordinates, for example. These are just numbers. They are not rendered. They are not showing anything. They are just a collection of numbers. I would say maybe measuring is more proper than analyzing. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Like, wouldn't you know the map of this model, um, the, the, the light photons that enter the satellite cameras? While, well, I mean, this is probably already a collage of several satellite images, mm -hmm. but already kind of the satellite images that are part of this collage are already models. Yes. And and kind of and, and the map, which is kind of the data that is based on it, is simply the light uh, that is transferred, or that is going through a lens, and then through a camera, and then is converted, well, is, 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 is coming to a sensor, and then the sensor kind of already um, uh, transforms uh, the map, which is something that we as human beings, uh, well, we can't see photons, but it's kind of yeah, it's not render. But that's why I ask. Yeah, yeah and so, but just let me um, continue your thought. Is uh, it is not that um, you should start with a map and then you have a model. Is that you you think I think having a model already from reality brings you to have a map. So. I think if you try to define how is it that we have the satellite image now in these uh, turns or like, you know, steps will be hard, but I think they are happening anyway. So if we are aware of how we can make them happen on our terms, it will actually make us conceive or produce ma uh, models or information that is able, sorry, that can, we can communicate easier and that uh, have a lot of intentionality. And we can argue. So, like for example, all these maps that we were showing you, they are there because we agree on them. So we have an agreement. Like we, we so people sit in a room and they show this map and say, "Do you agree on this?" Yes, we agree. But it's like we it, all the things that we are seeing now represented are because we tend to agree on they as the thing they are. So we can also agree that this is a model that help us navigate through the world, but this is not the world, or this is not, this cannot be only the world. But once I, for example, want to um, find out the relations between different um, city top views, mm -hmm. I, I could use, let's say, a map of several models of satellite images and and then and my output of, of this kind of correlation algorithm would then be a model again because it always is just what do you input and what do you output no mm -hmm. yeah but that, exactly that's what we're saying it's out of the map yeah, you just, can have a model and then yeah, exactly. go and on and on but i think you two you two second row will have a question do you have yes no, no. <laughs> I saw you that you were interested in this. No, no, yeah, but no, but no question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, should we continue with the code? Or yeah. yeah, so we have a break and then we continue with code. 
And while we're running the code together with Google, I will go around you. Mm -hmm. And if you have any question on how to run Mathematic or install or anything, just ask then. And then I will also help you how to run it yeah. line by line. So we have um, 10 minutes or five minutes break? Five minutes break. <laughs>